Draw My Life Joy Lewis Part 2 I mentioned earlier that very young atheists carry a kind of insurance against atheist despair. Though they believe in nothing else, they will believe firmly in the importance of their own emotions and desires. During the depression, my spiritual insurance had lapsed. For one thing, I was getting a little old for the flitting butterfly stuff. At 22, a girl begins to want a serious purpose. For another, though I myself was prosperous and secure, my friends were not. To live entirely for my own pleasures, with hungry men selling apples on every street corner, demanded a callousness of which I seemed incapable. Maybe no rational person would worry about the rest of the world. I found myself worrying all the same. And I wanted to do something, so I joined the Communist Party. My motives were a mixed lot. Youthful rebelliousness, youthful vanity, youthful contempt of the stupid people who seemed to be running society. All these played a part. The world was out of joint, and goody-goody, who so fit as I to set it right? Art had something to do with my decision, for those were the years in which great films and books and music were coming out of the Soviet Union. The war in Spain had much to do with it. Most of all, however, I think I was moved by the same unseen power that had directed my reading and my dreaming. I became a communist because, later on, I was going to become a Christian. I am not trying to excuse myself. I did something quite inexcusable. I entered the party in a burst of emotion, without making the slightest effort to study Marxist theory. All I knew was that capitalism wasn't working very well, war was imminent, and socialism promised to change all that, and for the first time in my life I was willing to be my brother's keeper, so I rushed round to a party acquaintance and said I wanted to join. Wait a minute, said she, listening suspiciously to my bubblings. You mean you want to join for the sake of other people? Then and there I told my first lie for the party. Her tone warned me that I was in danger of rejection. To hell with other people, I declared. I want to join the communists for my own sake, because I know I can't have a decent future without socialism. My friend relaxed and smiled. My Marxist education, the process of getting rid of my bourgeois values, had begun. I went to the meetings in Madison Square Garden, I and 20,000 like me, and there we felt ourselves linked by that surge of spiritual power which unites all meetings of genuine worshippers, whatever they worship. A feeling of solidarity, we called it in our horrible jargon, and never remembered the text that runs, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Later, however, the dry rot began. Like the fabulous snake that swallowed its own tail and vanished, the corrupt philosophy of Marxism devoured the very motives that made Marxists of us. Self-interest is the law, I was taught. The ultimate victory of the party was my victory. My visionary fairyland, transferred from somewhere out of space to somewhere ahead in time, began to seem at last a possible, even a probable goal. The Never Never Land turned into the Comes the Revolution Country. I was working for heaven on earth, in short, and that end justified all means. And so the means I used began to corrupt me. I had no idea what was happening to me, of course. Most American communists are anything but scholars, as their leaders ruefully admit. They are unwilling to master Marxist theory, though it is true that the party makes every effort to teach them. In consequence, communist philosophy works on them by stealth. They do not see the deadly change from losing self in class to losing class in self. They never guess that they will end by justifying as the future good of the working class every imaginable indulgence of their own pride. With my few scraps of knowledge, I was accepted almost at once as a journalist and critic on the party's semi-official magazine, New Masses, and I began to learn. 
I learned that love of the people made it all right for us to lie to the rank and file of the party. Still worse, that in practice our vague love of the people turned into quite specific hatred of the people's enemies, and that the enemies of the people were all those of every class and opinion who happened to disagree with the party. Hatred to us was a virtue, and much as we hated fascism, we hated even more bitterly the anti-fascist liberals who were our rivals for the support of Labour. I can remember a new masses editor, while the war against Hitler was at its hottest, saying solemnly, We can see now that the real enemies are the social democrats. I learned too that my judgment of a book or movie must depend not on its artistic merit, but on its Marxist orthodoxy, or even on whether its author was a liberal contributor to the party's needy treasury and that, at the sight of a hero, a martyr, or a genius, I must say, not, how wonderful, but, how can we use him? I resisted all this somewhat, but mostly I gave in to it, even before pressure was applied, and then persuaded myself that it wasn't there. By nature, I am the sort of woman who nurses sick kittens, and hates to spank her bad little boys. Yet, as a Marxist, I would have been willing to shoot people without trial. In practice, I willingly gave my spare time, my spare cash, my love of truth, and my artistic conscience. Fortunately for me, I was never asked to do anything more dangerous than that. There were, however, some signs of health in me. I made jokes at the party's expense. I continued, in the teeth of the party's contempt, to read fantasy and I utterly failed to read the dreary books we called proletarian novels. Though I reproached myself bitterly for it, moreover, I was bored at meetings. Presently, I married a veteran of the Spanish War, the writer, William Lindsay Grisham. Together we made a startling discovery. Marriage had ended, overnight, all our lingering interest in going to party social gatherings. I realised then a hitherto unsuspected attraction for the young which the Communist Party shares with the church social. It is a great matchmaker. My husband had lost his enthusiasm for communist speeches in Spain. What war did for him, childbirth did for me. My little son was a real thing, and so was my obligation to him. By comparison, my duty to that imaginary entity, the working class, seemed the most doubtful of abstractions. I began to notice what neglected, neurotic waifs the children of so many communists were, and to question the genuineness of a love of mankind that didn't begin at home. Meanwhile, the party itself was changing. During the Depression, an honest anger at injustice and misery had brought many able and generous men into it. Now, a renewed faith in America and dismay at the antics of the Soviet Union took them out of it again. The few who remained were chiefly embittered failures, more interested in revenge on the existing society than in building a better one. What had been the leading cultural force of the 30s dwindled, in the 40s, to a circle of amateur Russian agents. Far from being the sinister and efficient conspirators of newspaper imagination, however, the present communists are so clumsy that they antagonise American workers every time they open their mouths. By 1946 I had two babies, I had no time for party activity, and was glad of it. I hardly mentioned the party except with impatience, and yet, out of sheer habit, I went on believing that Marxism was true habit and something more, for I had no knowledge of divine help, and all the world had lost faith in gradual progress. If now, in the day of the atomic bomb, I were to lose my trust in violent means of creating heaven on earth, what earthly hope was there? A year or so before this, my interest in fantasy had led me to C.S. Lewis, The Screwtape Letters, and The Great Divorce. These books stirred an unused part of my brain to momentary sluggish life. Of course, I thought, atheism was true, but I hadn't given quite enough attention to developing the proof of it. Someday, when the children were older, 
I'd work it out. Then I forgot the whole matter. That was all on the surface. And yet, that was a beginning. Francis Thompson symbolised God as the hound of heaven pursuing on relentless feet. With me, God was more like a cat. He had been stalking me for a very long time, waiting for his moment. He crept nearer so silently that I never knew he was there. Then all at once, he sprang. My husband had been overworking. One day, he telephoned me from his New York office, I was at home in Westchester with the children, to tell me that he was having a nervous breakdown. He felt his mind going. He couldn't stay where he was, and he couldn't bring himself to come home. Then he rang off. There followed a day of frantic and vain telephoning. By nightfall there was nothing left to do but wait and see if he turned up, alive or dead. I put the babies to sleep and waited. For the first time in my life I felt helpless. For the first time my pride was forced to admit that I was not, after all, the master of my fate and the captain of my soul. All my defences, the walls of arrogance and cocksureness and self-love behind which I had hid from God, went down momentarily, and God came in. How can one describe the direct perception of God? It is infinite, unique. There are no words, there are no comparisons. Can one scoop up the sea in a teacup? Those who have known God will understand me. The others, I find, can neither listen nor understand. There was a person with me in the room, directly present to my consciousness. A person so real that all my previous life was, by comparison, mere shadow play. And I myself was more alive than I had ever been. It was like waking from sleep. So intense a life cannot be endured for long by flesh and blood. We must ordinarily take our life watered down, diluted as it were, by time and space and matter. My perception of God lasted perhaps half a minute. In that time, however, many things happened. I forgave some of my enemies. I understood that God had always been there and that, since childhood, I had been pouring half my energy into the task of keeping him out. I saw myself as I really was, with dismay and repentance, and seeing I changed. I have been turning into a different person since that half minute, everyone tells me. When it was over, I found myself on my knees, praying. I think I must have been the world's most astonished atheist. My surprise was so great that for a moment it distracted me from my fear. Only for a moment, however. My awareness of God was no comforting illusion conjured up to reassure me about my husband's safety. I was just as worried afterward as before. No, it was terror and ecstasy, repentance and rebirth. When my husband came home, he accepted my experience without question. He was himself on the way to something of the kind. Together, in spite of illness and anxiety, we set about remaking our minds. For obviously they needed it. If my knowledge of God was true, the thinking of my whole life had been false. I could not doubt the truth of my experience. It was so much the realest thing that had ever happened to me, and in a gentler, less overwhelming form, it went right on happening. So, my previous reasoning was at fault, and I must somehow find the error. I snatched at books I had despised before, reread The Hound of Heaven, which I had ridiculed as a piece of phony rhetoric, and, understanding it suddenly, burst into tears also a new thing, I had seldom previously cried except with rage. I went back to C.S. Lewis and learned from him, slowly, how I had gone wrong. Without his works, I wonder if I and many others might not still be infants crying in the night. 
One of my first acts of faith was a renewed interest in the Communist Party. Logical enough, for though materialism had proved false, I still thought Marxist economic theory was sound. While I remained an atheist, party work had been a matter of inclination, but once I recognised God, I recognised moral responsibility, and it seemed I had a duty to do party work whether I wanted to be a communist or not. If I had found, as I thought, a mistake in Marxist philosophy, my job was to show that the party didn't need atheism. Couldn't socialism be built upon the golden rule? And so I did, at long last, what I should have done in the first place. I studied Marxist theory. It was a difficult and painful study. Inch by inch I retreated from my revolutionary position. Fallacy after fallacy, contradiction upon contradiction, absurdity upon absurdity turned up in Lenin's materialism and imperial criticism, one of the basic textbooks of Marxist philosophers. This is not the place for taking dialectical materialism apart. Enough to say that it was unsound as philosophy to begin with, and that its scientific foundation had been swept away by Einstein's early work even before Lenin wrote. Even yet, I did not quite give up. I tried to cling to Marxist economics at least. Then I realised that this economics assumed an infinitely increasing food supply, and that any farmer knew better. I reminded myself of the wonderful achievements of Soviet Russia, and realised that I had taken them all on faith. I had no idea what went on in Russia. Gradually, my communism shriveled up and blew away like a withered tumbleweed. I cannot tell exactly when it went, but I looked and found it gone. And something else had come in its place. I was by no means a Christian at first. All my atheist life I had regarded the apostate with traditional Jewish horror. What I wanted was to become a good Jew of the comfortable, reformed persuasion. I had the usual delusion that all religions mean the same thing. Fortunately, I had learned my lesson, and this time I looked before I leaped. I studied religions, and found them anything but the same thing. Some of them had wisdom up to a point. Some of them had good ethical intentions. Some of them had flashes of spiritual insight but only one of them had complete understanding of the grace and repentance and charity that had come to me from God, and the Redeemer who had made himself known, whose personality I would have recognised among ten thousand. Well, when I read the New Testament, I recognised him. He was Jesus. The rest was fairly simple. I could not doubt the divinity of Jesus, and step by step, Orthodox Christian theology followed logically from it. My modernist objections to the miraculous proved to be mere superstition, unsupported by logic. I am a writer of fiction. I have made up stories myself, and I think I can tell a made-up story from a true one. The men who told of the resurrection told of something they had seen. Not Shakespeare himself could have invented the synoptic gospels. My beliefs took shape. I accepted the sacraments as meaningful, but not magical. I recognised the duty of going to church, while I rejected the claim of any church to infallibility and an absolute monopoly on divine authority. So what I was, it appeared, was a Protestant Christian of the Orthodox Trinitarian kind. The church nearest my present home in Dutchess County, New York, happened to be Presbyterian. I visited it and found that its theology suited me well. Perhaps I should be equally at home with Methodists and Episcopalians and some others, but it was in the Presbyterian Church of Pleasant Plains that I was baptised in 1948 and saw my children baptised, and there, if I may, I will remain. <laughs>